Thank you so much. I feel honoured and quite overwhelmed to have been chosen as the winner of this amazing prize. Let me start by saying a big thank you to the five members of the jury and to the Goethe Institute New York for all the time and effort they've dedicated to this prize. I'm sorry that due to the COVID restrictions, I can't be with you in person in New York today. But I'm really grateful to the Goethe Institute here in London for enabling me to join you remotely. Huge thanks to Tyne and Kogane and the team at New Directions for all their support, including, including entering me for this prize. And of course, to my UK publisher, MacLehose Press, represented by Katerina Bielenberg here today. And in particular, my editor, Bill Swainson. It all started in November 2018, when I received an email from Bill inviting me to submit a translation of a sample from what he described as a book-shaped cabinet of curiosities, just out in Germany, an extraordinary work on the theme of loss and what loss leaves behind. At that point, I'd been knocking on publishers' doors for three years with little success. Bill's willingness to take a chance on a relatively unknown translator changed everything for me. And I feel incredibly privileged to have had the benefit of his great wisdom and experience throughout. Thanks also to my mum, whose fantastically eagle-eyed proofreading was a huge help. But of course, my biggest thank you of all goes to the author herself. I was extremely fortunate to be able to meet Judith while I was working on the translation. I was approached by the Europäisches Übersetzer Kollegium in Strahlen in Germany to take part in a week-long workshop bringing together the author and all the translators from around the world who were translating her book at the time. It was the perfect opportunity for us to learn more about the thinking behind the book and put all our questions to Judith. She went out of her way to help us in every way she could, and for that, I'm immensely grateful. If you've read the book, you'll probably have an inkling that translating it was not without its challenges, and you'd be right. The first thing many people would notice is the precision and density and complexity of the prose and at times it certainly took some linguistic gymnastics to render it into English. And what about those long sentences? A page long in one or two cases. Some have suggested that for the reader's sake, these ought to have been broken down into shorter sentences. But I wasn't so sure. Judith could have written shorter sentences if she'd wanted to. By breaking up these sentences, I would have changed the texture of the writing. I would have interrupted the gentle rhythms and rolling flow of the prose and given the English reader an altogether different experience than the German reader. It would have seemed like a betrayal, another loss to add to the losses that the book mourns. And so those lengthy sentences stayed. Here's a passage I like, for example. It's the opening to the piece on the lost writings of the prophet Mani, in which the narrator sets the scene in ancient Babylonia. And if holy things really are only revealed to holy people, then it would be here in the shimmering noon glare of a high desert sun, beneath the ragged date palms lining the banks of a sinuous tributary of the mighty many branching Euphrates, which in late spring swells with the snow melt from the northern mountains into a torrential river prone to burst its banks and dams, pumps vast masses of water into the impressive channels of the finer and finer branching irrigation system, which reaches into remote, indeed the remotest, rain-deprived and rainless lowlands, fills diked basins, soaks fallow ground, makes bucket wheels turn and seeds sprout and flourish, and guarantees the two annual harvests that are, that are the reason for this land's fame and riches. The corn, 
the mountains of pomegranates, figs and dates that float downstream on countless hundreds of rafts until the watercourse, reaching the marshy delta, is united with its twin river and flows swollen towards the sea. Here is the land of the beginning, the alluvial land of civilization, to which our remote ancestor with his heavy skull and freed up hands was once drawn, in the process driving his wide-jawed cousin with the nostril-like flared nasal orifices and the melancholy bulges above his primate's eyes, ever further north, where he hid himself away in caves, armed with stone tools and bones gnawed bare, to die the unlamented death of his species. And out of the zigzag movements of the nomadic tribes, there evolved a vague order. Tribes became peoples who lined up their settlements along the meandering rivers like beads on a long, fine spun thread. Each town a kingdom in itself, a community of commoners who began to share the work and wages, the harvest, the yield, and in the absence of stone, wood and ore, built themselves a world of clay. Mortar rendered reed huts and simple round buildings for the shoeless peasants, square palaces for curly bearded kings, wind buffeted citadels and dust swept ziggurats, avenues of blue glazed bricks guarded by bull men and winged lions, gently raised reliefs of priests in long rows with crossed arms, densely inscribed clay tablets covered in dainty symbols like bird tracks in wet sand. The 12 texts were also chock full of historical, cultural and nature references that needed to be just right in English too. So I found myself researching, say, the correct, names, correct English names of ancient Greek writers and philosophers one day and 18th century nautical terminology the next. The Greifswald Harbour essay describes a walk tracing the course of a river and is full of minutely detailed observations of nature, so this threw up particular challenges. When the dictionary failed me on plant species, I resorted to tracking them down by their Latin names. Descriptions of birdsong also had to be spot on, so I listened to recordings to discover whether the wind chat is more of a warbler or a whistler, whether the song of a chaffinch sounds more like piping or chirping, and so on. Encyclopedia in the Wood, the piece about the loner artist and his private obsessions, caused me a rather more unusual research issue. At one point, I had to close my office curtains because I didn't really want the neighbours to spot me looking up technical details of fetish equipment. It wasn't just about getting my facts right. It was about finding the right voice for each piece. The book has been described as genre-defying, and that's very much the case. It includes elements of memoir, fiction, academic and historical essays, nature writing, philosophical meditation. Perhaps the most fun and most challenging piece in terms of voice was The Boy in Blue, which consists of a fictional interior monologue by Swedish-American actress Greta Garbo as she strolls through Manhattan having a good old moan about her fading youth. I think my favourite piece, one which called for a very different narrative voice, a wildly inventive story which appeals to my romantic streak. In it, a 19th century bohemian botanist employed on a royal estate develops a fascination with the moon and ends up living there as a kind of curator of lost objects. I loved immersing myself in his slightly archaic, academic, rather pedantic narrative style and having a rare excuse to use words like forthwith and alas in my translation. I guess my overall aim was to try to produce a true reflection of the original text, to stay faithful to it, not just in my word choices, but also, where possible, in the general flow and flavour of the prose. To not add anything and not take anything away. In other words, to make myself, as the translator, invisible. 
After all, it's often been said that invisibility is the hallmark of a good translator. In the words of Norman Shapiro, a good translation is like a pane of glass. It should never call attention to itself. Lucy Hughes Hallett, the head judge of this year's International Booker Prize, recently described translation as the most modest and self-effacing of literary arts. And as a person who's naturally a little timid and reserved, it suits me not to call attention to myself. When I'd heard that I'd when I heard that I'd been chosen as the winner of this prize, once I'd finished jumping for joy, I then started worrying to myself, oh no, am I going to have, a give, have to give a speech? Will people be looking at me? Yes, this prize does put the translator in the spotlight, but actually, what an important and wonderful thing it is to honour the painstaking, highly skillful and creative work of the translator that so often goes unnoticed. What if there were no translators and no translated fiction? How much poorer our lives would be? Translation brings, a, brings us a taster of other countries, other cultures. It tears down the barriers between ourselves and others and lets us actually get inside the heads of people from beyond our own sphere of experience. It helps us understand and embrace the world. Let me finish with an excerpt from the piece about the sunken island of Tuanaki. So the two ships drifted along with limp sails and that booming silence began to settle on them, so fundamentally different from the peaceful hush of my library existence. Sometimes, though, I could hear the rolling, long-drawn-out groundswell, the taunting of the fine weather, the endless litany of waves forever welling up and subsiding that once seduced Magellan into describing this ocean as the peaceful one a ghostly harmony, the remorseless sound of eternity, more terrifying than the most violent storm, which at least is bound to blow over in time. Yet this ocean was neither peaceful nor placid, for in its darkest depths lurked indomitable forces that were certain to return. Its seabed was fissured and furrowed, the earth's crust riven with submarine trenches and peaks, unhealed scars from that prehistoric age when the as yet undivided continents, adrift as a single mass in the global ocean, were torn asunder by colossal forces and rammed up against the Earth's mantle until their plates were forced, some over, some under each other, down into plunging abysses, up into clear daylight, surrendered to the laws of nature, which know neither mercy nor justice. Then finally, at 10 a.m. on March the 29th, 1777, the Discovery, travelling ahead on the leeward side, hoisted the red, white and blue flag of Holland, the signal for a sighting of land. At almost the same moment, the grey, blue, shimmering coast became visible on the northeastern horizon from the masthead of the Resolution as well, barely more real than the Mirage. The ships headed for the unknown strip of land twinkling in the distance until the sun went down and tacked all night until the break of day, approaching to within a distance of about four miles of the island, whose south side must have pre presented an almost painfully enchanting image in the light of the sun as it rose out of the water. Profoundly moved by the heavenly sight, several of the crew members immediately took up quills and brushes using watery colours and brush strokes displaying varying degrees of skill to capture the auspicious panorama somewhere other than in unreliable memory. The hills of moderate height shimmering purple in the morning sun. Their wooded summits with their many hued trees and scattered palm crowns. The lush, dense green vegetation of the hillsides. The coconuts, breadfruit and plantain visible through the bluish-pink haze. Thank you for listening. <laughs>